Well, welcome once again to Mosaic Church. Uh, we're going to start a new series today called A Thrill of Hope. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and pull those out or open the app on your phone and turn to John chapter 1, verse 1. And today we're going to talk about who is our hope, right? Who is our hope? Who is our hope? When we talk about our hope, it's usually future focused. When we talk about, man, I'm just hoping for the day or I'm look forward, looking forward to, it usually has to do with something that is not yet here, right? We put our hope in so many things. We put our hope in the weekend. Anybody who's ever been there, you're like, man, I just can't wait to get there. And then about this time in the weekend, you're already thinking about tomorrow and your hope is starting to decline, right? And so it's like this vicious cycle that throughout the week, you know, your hope is going up and up and up and up. And you get to the weekend and you're like, oh, it's finally here. And then before you know it, it's over, right? We do the same with vacation. We're like, oh, if I could just get to vacation this summer. You know, right about now, everybody is starting to, you know, the reality is setting in that it's getting cold and, and we had our first snowfall. And some of you that just dread the winter, uh, your heart just began to sink just a little bit this week. Anybody? Anybody feel it? It's just like, oh, man, here we go again. Some of us, we put our hope in our stuff, right? What we've got, our talent, our money. Some of you, you put your hope in, in that device that's in your hand, and you don't even remember how to get anywhere without it anymore, right? It's like, how many of you, you know how to get somewhere, but out of habit, you like punch it in the map on your phone uh, just so you don't have to think about it, right? It's like you don't even think anymore. You just turn on the GPS, and, you, and, and when it tells you to turn, you turn, and, and your hope is in that little device on the dashboard. And when you leave the house without it, You've got this freak out moment. Anybody ever had the freak out moment when you leave the house without the phone? And you're like, how am I going to live or survive without my phone today? Sometimes we put our hope in a season. You know, a lot of times people, you know, during December, they talk about just the, the, the peace or the Christmas cheer of the season. And this world that offers so many fleeting feelings, Right? And we begin to do things that we wouldn't normally do. We spend money we don't have. You know, it's like, man, if, it's, if we don't have it, we just charge it. We spend money we don't have to impress people we don't like. It's so backwards, right? There's a someday. It's like there's always something out there that we're going to get to someday. And we rarely find our hope in the moment. It's always in something that we don't have. It's like this imaginary carrot that is continually, you know, out in front of us and, and we, we run and we run and we run, but we just can't ever catch it. And we think to ourselves, man, someday, you know, this virus will be over. Someday I won't have to wear this mask ever again. Someday I can see my friends' faces again, like in real life, right? And not on a screen. Someday. But I love how John starts out his gospel. You see, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in Matthew, it starts out with a genealogy, basically, who had who. Like somebody was the father of somebody, and it started, you know, back with Abraham, and then it jumped to David, and it goes on from there all the way to Christ. The, the gospel of Mark, it starts out with John the Baptist, who came and prepared the way for Christ. And then the, the gospel of Luke, it starts out with John the Baptist's parents, and what happened with Zechariah and Elizabeth, you know, when, that, when, when, when she had John the Baptist, which prepared the way for Jesus. But John... The Gospel of John starts before all of that, before you, before me, and everything that came before, before the dawn of creation is where John starts. And so read with me today, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Here we go. In the beginning, the word already existed. Underline already if you can. 
The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is true light, gives, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Guide our hearts today, help us to be open, help our hearts to be soft, help help our minds to just be receptive to what your spirit would say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. What I know when I read that passage and what is so powerful in how John starts his gospel is that we see that our hope has always existed. It's not only something in the future. Our hope was established before the dawn of creation. Our hope has never died. Our hope isn't a thing. It's not something that's going to come and go like a date on the calendar. Our hope is a person. The word that John starts with when he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, the word is Jesus Christ. That word is the baby that was born in the manger. That word is the one that came as a human to die for all mankind. And so we ask this question here at Christmas time who is this baby born in a manger? You see, many people celebrate Christmas and they go throughout the holiday and then they never even consider why they're really celebrating or what it's really all about. But when you really ask, who is this baby in a manger? What is Christmas really all about? This is both an historic and a personal question. This question has been debated by church leaders throughout the first few centuries of the church. Heresies abound based on the answers to this question, who is the baby in the manger? The question obviously drives the wedge between, between traditional Judaism and Christianity. This question is the stumbling block for Muslims, for Jehovah Witnesses, for Unitarians when they think about Christianity. When you think about it, to say that the baby in the manger is God in the flesh, to say that the baby in the manger is God, it's probably the most staggering claim in all of Christianity. And once you accept this claim, Everything else makes sense. It's the starting point for all of Christianity. It's the starting point of a relationship with God when you believe and you trust that God really is who he says he was and that Jesus really was the Son of God. When you think about it, is it really that astounding to see Jesus walking on the water if we know that he created the water? When you think about it, is it really that astounding to see him take five loaves and two fish and feed over 5,000 people when we know that he's the one that created the loaves and the fish and the stomachs of every single person that would be digesting that food? Is it really that astounding that he's telling the people that are dead to come back back to life and that he himself comes back to life based on his own power? When you think about it, Once you receive and you accept and you believe and embrace the fact that God lived among us, it's really not that astounding to to believe that God, that Jesus rose from the dead if he's the one that created it all in the first place. It all starts with who Jesus is. Church, who is our hope? 
Listen, what you believe about Jesus is the most important thing about you. The most important thing about your life is who he is. It's not even who you are. It's who he is. The answer to this question, who is Jesus, has ramifications for every single person in this room and every single person in all of history. All of our lives and our eternity are dependent on how we answer this question. If we're not careful around Christmas, we will talk about shepherds and angels and wise men and Joseph and Mary and mangers and oxen and all of that and miss it. The hope that comes from Christmas is not found in the circumstances of the birth of Jesus, but in the identity of the baby in the manger. And so if you want hope, you need to know Jesus. And so let's get to know him through this passage today. 1 John 1, or not 1 John, the the Gospel of John 1 through 14. When we look at this passage, we see a few truths about Christmas. And so let's dive in. There's notes on your seat. You can fill in the blanks. You can look at the notes on the app. Let's dig in. So the first thing that we see in this passage is that the baby in the manger is God. It says the word was with God and the word was God. Hebrews 1.3 says it like this. He is Jesus, the exact representation of God's being. And so how do we know that Jesus is God? Man, we can look through scripture. Jesus himself testified to his own divinity. In John 10.30, he said, I and the Father are one. In John 8.58, he said something that to the Jews in the Jewish culture was staggering. He said, before Abraham was born, Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation in their minds. And so before Abraham was born, I am The people that heard him say that knew that he was claiming to be God because because when he said that, guess what they did? They tried to stone him because they thought he was committing blasphemy, claiming to be God. We see in Mark chapter 2 the healing of the paralytic when Jesus healed the paralytic. And before Jesus healed him, he said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And the people said to him, who can forgive, forgive sins but God alone? And here Jesus is acting on God's behalf as God, judging and forgiving sins. We see him having power over nature, disease, and death. All throughout the Gospels, he's calming storms. He's telling the wind and the waves to stop. He's feeding over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. He's healing people of their diseases. He ultimately rises from the dead based on his own power and his own authority. We see, him, we see him being proclaimed as the creator of all things. In John 1, 3, it says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. He's the creator. In Colossians 1, 15, it says, Christ is the, invi- is the image of the invisible God. By him all things were created. All things were created by him and for him. He created all things. Colossians 2.9 says, In Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Did you get that? In Christ, all the fullness of deity. Deity means God. Dwells in bodily form. He is the eternal creator of all things, and he is the sovereign sustainer of all things. The Bible doesn't say that about anybody else but Jesus. If that is true about what Jesus did and what he said and what the Bible says about him and what other people said about him, then we only have a few options. Remember, what you think about Jesus is the most important thing about you. And your hope isn't found in a thing, it's found in a person. And so listen up. So number one, we have a few options. Number one, we could say that Jesus was just a legend. Some people say that, that it's just all made up. The only problem with that is that there's more historical reliability and verifiability for the gospel accounts and the and and eyewitnesses to Jesus than any other book in the ancient world, than any other happening. And so if he's not a legend, if Jesus really was a true person, then maybe he was just a liar. 
Listen, almost all people, whether they're pagan, secular scholars, or believers, say that Jesus was a humble and a meek leader. But listen, if Jesus went around saying that he was God and he wasn't God, then would you call him humble or meek? No. You'd call him a liar if he said he was something that he was not. But what if Jesus didn't think he was lying, but he wasn't God? What would that make him? That would make him crazy. (laughs) He'd be a lunatic, right? If I got up here today and said, hey, guys, I'm God, you should get up and leave. And you'd be like, that dude's crazy. So, But even secular scholars have called Jesus one of the greatest religious teachers in the history of the world. Listen, it's not possible for him to be one of the greatest religious teachers of all the world if at the core of his teaching was the claim that he was God and he wasn't. Right? Because that would make him a lunatic. And so he's either legend, he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or... He really is who he says he was. He's Lord. You have to make that choice today. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. I love this quote. He said, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him. You can kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. Listen, Christianity isn't just about following a good set of rules that just so happen to be good for life and good for you and good for other people. Christianity is about the fact that Jesus came, and he really was God in the flesh. You see, part of our hope is that Jesus is who he said he was, and we can trust him. Jesus is God. Number two, our hope comes from the fact that the baby in the manger is human. Verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, So the word became human and made his home among us. God in the flesh, human, born with a body, right? that would get hungry, it would get thirsty, a body that would need sleep. Luke 2.52 says that Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature and in favor with God and man. He would learn to eat and talk and read and write. Jesus had human emotions. He would laugh. He would cry. His heart would become troubled. He would become overwhelmed with sorrow. He would experience joy and he would experience anger just like you and me. Part of our hope is that Jesus not only fully identifies with God, but he fully identifies with you. Amen? Don't miss this. He's familiar with your struggles. Hebrews chapter 4 says that Jesus was tempted just as we are. Multiple times, whether it was in the desert when he was tempted by the devil, whether it was when Peter said to him, no, you can't go to the cross whether it was when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was going to the cross and and he was sweating drops of blood at the thought of what was to come before him, whether it was people yelling at him when he was on the cross, if you really are the Son of God, bring yourself down from there. Jesus struggled and he was tempted just like you and me. Hebrews chapter 2 says that he has been tempted and therefore he's able to help those who are being tempted. You and me. Who's your hope? He's familiar with your sorrow. Isaiah 53 says that he's a man of many sorrows. He's capable of unparalleled sympathy with you and me. He's familiar with our sufferings. Most clearly this was This was shown by his suffering on the cross. He was capable of suffering. He felt pain. He felt agony. He felt the torture that was done to him on your behalf and mine. Part of our hope is that there's nothing you will ever go through that Jesus can't relate with. Aren't you so thankful for that today? The third reason that we can find hope in the person 
and when we get to know Jesus Christ, is that the baby in the manger is our hope for salvation. Amen? So the baby in the manger was God. He was human. And he's our hope for salvation. Verse 5 says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Right? In your darkest moment, when everything seems lost, when you feel like life has just gone off the rails, when people have left you, when your family, like a bomb blew up in your family and everything's falling apart and you feel alone and you feel like everything has gone wrong, Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. And then verse 9, it says, The one who is the true light who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world created, he, the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. S- listen, other people perceived Jesus as someone who was just like them. And while he was human, and he can identify with you, he was so much more than just that. You go to Matthew chapter 13, and you see even in his hometown, they said, where where did this man come from? He's just a carpenter's son. How is he doing all these things? They were offended by him. People were looking at him like he was no different than they were. Listen, the creator God, the creator of all the universe, he stooped to a point where he was not even recognized by his own creation. Think about that. The hope for our salvation came and was not even recognized by those that he created. His glory that is known throughout the whole earth is not even acknowledged by the people in front of him. Could that be you today? That Jesus has been in front of you, you've heard about him, You've been challenged by his message, but he's so close and at the same time so far away. Have you ever known somebody in your life that even though you knew about them and you were even around them a lot, you felt like you didn't really know them? And they were so close to you, but at the same time they were so far away. And there were so many people that came, got right up close to Jesus and never realized that he was their hope for salvation. Not only was he known by them, he was subject to them. Think about this. He obeyed his parents. He was fed by people as a baby. He grew. He worked for people as a carpenter. Can you imagine how it would feel to be employed by somebody that you crafted with your own hands and you submitted to their authority as your employer? Jesus did that. He was the hope for our salvation, and yet he humbled himself. Not even the most religiously devout people in Israel recognized him as the hope for salvation. In fact, in John 8, 48, they said to him, you are a Samaritan and a demon. Can you imagine they said that to the hope of their salvation? In other words, they called him a traitor and the devil. That's how they responded to him all the way until the day when he was falsely accused and they put him through a mock trial. They spit in his face. They beat him, they flogged him, and he didn't say a word. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death. And when he had no sin, the payment for sin was death upon him. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. He took what we owed on himself. You see, Jesus was uniquely qualified to be a substitute for our sins. When we deserved death, He became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The reality is Jesus came to die. He came as the hope for our salvation. Right? The reality is if if he would have done all the things that he did, healing people and teaching and and being a, a sinless person, but if he didn't go to the cross... If he would have just stopped there, if in the garden he would have chosen not to continue and not to go to the cross and not actually die in your place and mine, mine, then he would not be our Savior. The very reason the baby came in the manger was to die. He's our hope for salvation. 
He had to pay the price that you and I were supposed to pay. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live in righteousness. You see, part of the reason that we can have hope today is because Jesus is our hope of salvation. The baby in the manger is worthy of everything that we have to give him because he came to save us. He's the sinless Savior born on Christmas to die for sinners like you and like me. The fourth reason, and we'll close with this today, is that the baby in the manger is the exalted Lord. He's the, he's the exalted Lord. He's God, fully God. He was fully human. He came as the hope for our salvation. And he's going to be the exalted Lord for all of eternity. But this isn't something that's just far off. This is something that happens in your life and mine. In verse 14, it says, He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. He's glorified. He's lifted up. See, this is the heart of the New Testament, that Jesus is Lord. Almost 750 times in the New Testament, Jesus is confessed as Lord. The heart of the Christmas story is that the baby in the manger is indeed Lord of all. He's not just the greatest among many gods. He is the only God in a class by himself. There is none higher. Church, I cannot say it enough. What you think about Jesus and how you view Jesus, and where Jesus sits in your thoughts and in your imagination, and how you perceive him is the most important thing about you. His name represents so much more than, than just what we call him. His name represents his authority. He has the power to save you from your sins. He has the power to rule your life. He has the authority to rule every decision that you will ever make, every possession you own, every dream that you ever have. He's Lord of it all. And so the question to ask when we think about the fact that the baby in the manger is the exalted Lord, is he as exalted as Lord in my life? He's not just our Savior. He has to be our Lord as well. It's a package deal. You can't have one without the other. When he saves you from your sins, you also acknowledge him as Lord. And that means that he deserves universal praise. And you know what? The Bible says that he's going to get that praise whether we give it to him or not. This is one of those truths of God's word that just boggles my mind because here we have such an amazing gift laid out in front of us and yet God in his grace he gives us the choice he gives us the choice whether we're going to praise him knowing full well that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the Bible says every knee shall bow. And when it says that, the, the, the meaning of, of the original language literally means to bend the knee. It's an expression used in the Old Testament show great reverence and submission and worship. This is a picture of a worshiper who literally cannot stand upright in the presence of the one who is being worshiped. So just think literal like I can't stand anymore and I drop to my knees. That's what will happen to every person who ever has lived and will live on the face of the planet. Every single knee in heaven and on earth and under and on earth and under the earth. The devil and his demons will bow their knee. Every single person in this room will bow their knee. Every single person on this planet will bow their knee. And every single person in all of history will bend their knee before Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is truth from every tongue, from every language, from every nation, every Muslim, every Buddhist, every Hindu, every religion you can ever name, every single person will bow.
Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, who is your hope? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declares that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so the decision you need to make today, church, individual, father, mother, daughter, son, whoever you are, you have two decisions. You can reject Jesus as Lord or you can revere Jesus as Lord. If you reject Jesus as Lord, you might call him a legend or you might call him a liar. You might call him a lunatic. And what will happen is you might reject him now, but you will bow your knee then. Here's the key that I want every person in this room to hear. The reality is that every day, every single person in this room and, and around the world is going to bow their knee. That's not up for decision. You have a choice to make now. But there will come a day and a time, and neither you nor I know when your choosing period is over. But there will come a day where you will make that choice. And you might not have a choice then. It's determined everyone will bow their knee. The question is, will you bow your knee now or will you bow the knee when it's too late? The other choice that you have is that you can revere Jesus as Lord now. While you are still alive, the Bible says that it's given to every man. Every man, every woman is given the chance to live and to make the choice once. I want to urge every single person in this room to choose Jesus as Lord and bow your knee today. Trust him to forgive you of all your sins, to cover over your sins with his sacrifice on the cross. Say to the one who made you and knows what's best for you, I trust you, Jesus. I confess that you are indeed Lord. I'm going to live like you are indeed Lord. I'm going to live with the hope that was and is and will forever be. 1 John 1, 9 says, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Why? Because you don't have a hope that is only in the future. You don't have a hope that is only in the present and will fade. You have a hope that has existed before the creation of the world, who sees you, who knows you, who knows your name, who knows how many hairs are on your head, who has a plan for your life, who has never let you down and never will let you down. And you have a choice today to revere him as Lord of your life, to live for him like there is no one else in the room. So we can bow our hearts today. We can be confident of this, that what lies ahead is eternal celebration, where we will delight in the declaration of, of the praise of Christ to the glory of God the Father in heaven. And for all of eternity, all glory and all honor will be his. He is God. He is human. He is our hope for salvation, and He is and will always be the exalted Lord. Is He your Lord? Bow your heads and close your eyes with me today. Where are you at, church? Where are you at, person? Whether you're here in the room, whether you're online today, is He your Lord? My hope and my prayer today is that you are confronted in the most grace-filled, loving way with the reality of who Jesus is, that he loved you so much that he came and he lived a, life, a sinless life so he could go to the cross, so he could suffer, 
so he could die in your place in life. There is no greater truth, there is no greater person that has ever walked the face of this planet that could possibly have taken that penalty on the cross for you and for me. Will you accept him? Will you trust him as your Lord today? Will you make that choice? Will you reject him? Or will you revere him as your Lord? With every head bowed and every eye eye closed in this place, if you want to revere him as your Lord today, you want to just say, Joe, I'm going to put him first. I'm going to trust Jesus with my life. I'm going to confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I'm going to let him forgive me of my sins. I'm going to let him throw my sin as far as the east is from the west. I'm going to let him make me white as snow. I'm going to live every day from this point forward in light of the fact that Jesus is Lord. If that's you today and you want to make that choice today, just raise your hand. By raising your hands, you're saying, Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Today I'm choosing to accept you, to revere you as Lord best decision that you'll ever make. There's no other decision that is more impactful in your life than this decision right now. If you're at home watching on your couch online, you can do it right now. We're going to pray a prayer together and I'm going to ask all God's people to repeat after me in celebration of those that are putting their faith and trust in Christ today. And so if you made that choice to follow Christ, just repeat after me today. Jesus, Come on, let's say it loud and proud. Jesus, I trust you with my life. I believe that you are Lord. That you are who you say you are. You are God. Thank you, Jesus, that you took the penalty for my sin. You died for me on the cross rose again on the third day and now I can have new life help me to live for you as my Lord thank you for being my Savior Amen Amen, let's give those a hand that accepted Christ as their Savior today if you accepted Christ today I encourage you to let somebody know whether it's me or one of our leaders here at the church or a friend. If you're online today, I encourage you to send me an email. Shoot me an email. You can send emails to info at mosaiccincinnati.com. I'd love to hear your story, what God's doing in your life. But man, your next step, if you gave your heart and your life to Christ, get baptized. You can sign up for baptism on our site. Uh, You can just come tell me, hey, I want to get baptized. We'll get you connected. You can write it in on your Connect card that's in front of you in the seat back pocket. If you did give your heart and life to Christ, grab one of those Connect cards out of, out of the, the seat in front of you and check that box. I trusted Jesus for my, with my life today. I decided to follow Jesus Christ today and turn that card in. We'd love to put some tools in your hands, next steps, resources to help you in your faith walk. Man, I'm so happy for you. I'm so glad you came to church today. I really believe when you come to church every Sunday, it's one of the best decisions that you make every single week. And so thanks for being faithful and being here. Um, If you're on our our board of directors or one of our elders, I just want to encourage you to come to the front at this time. Um, They're going to be here to pray for you as I dismiss you today. And I want to encourage you, if you need prayer, don't be bashful. Don't be afraid. It doesn't have to do with, you know, it doesn't have to be about the message today. It could be you need healing. It could be that you need hope. It could be that you need just encouragement. Come get prayer today. They'd love to pray with you. I'm going to pray. You can be dismissed. Don't forget our ushers are at the doors on the way out if you want to worship God with your giving. God, I pray that you bless your people. Uh, fill them with, with uh, just encouragement, with direction, with motivation to follow you and to serve you this week. Bless their families. Bless their goings and their comings and, and their work. And, and provide for them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thanks for being at Mosaic today. You're dismissed.